Thank you, Andy, and thank you, everyone, for uh, uh, coming uh, coming on to the discussion tonight. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, open and programmable finance in general, and specifically open and uh, programmable finance with Avalanche. Um, but before I do that, let me say a few words about where we are and uh, put everything in context. So blockchains today are an amazing disruptor of technology. Uh, they're bringing to us uh, essentially what I call a new era for humanity. And I don't mean that uh, you know, as hyperbole, I mean that as a genuinely new way of building uh, business processes into automated uh, systems such that we can disintermediate and get rid of middlemen, get rid of trust, and get rid of opportunities for uh, for financial uh, uh, financial capture and uh, and incumbents uh, collecting uh, rent at the expense of regular people. The innovation behind this is enormous. Up until now, we knew how to build what we call client service systems. In a client service system, there's always the service provider and the client. There is me and there's Facebook. There is me and there is Gmail. There is me and the plethora of services out there that I need to use to get my work done. And in every one of these cases, I am beholden to the service provider. With the invention of blockchains, we are going into a new era where we now can build really large Byzantine fault tolerant systems where there is nobody in charge and there is no designated service provider. The service itself is provided co collectively and cooperatively and can operate even in the presence of malicious actors within the service provision. So that's an amazing new thing to be able to do. And, and we now know about 10, 11 years after Bitcoin, that these systems can hold enormous value. The technology is now just beginning to mature. And this, of course, leads us to, um, to uh, uh, this leads us to borderless user-centric economies. And uh, it gives us the ability to put into digital form all kinds of assets that are currently on the books, that are currently of limited reach, and open them up to trade at a global scale. And that, of course, is an amazing new ability. The market is huge. Um, the, uh, the sum total is more than $1 trillion. The innovation here is fantastic. This is, of all the areas of computer science, I would maybe there's maybe a handful that I would say are rapidly innovating, and blockchains are one of them. And uh, there is also validation from the business world. Every single Fortune 500, minus maybe five of them or so, have tried their hand at blockchains. Granted, you know, they've tried private permission blockchains, and granted, they've never actually rolled any of those things into production because they were too early. That technology was mostly a dead end. But we now have the right building blocks for them to succeed, and now we're beginning to see uh, uh, interest from big financial players. And from my vantage point at IC3, um, I, I actually have a slightly bit of a, a slight bit of an advantage compared to other people because typically when people are about to enter the space, they come and talk to us, and um, that's how I was able to see long before anybody else did in the in the depths of the bear market. I knew that institutional money in the form of hedge funds was coming into crypto, and now I can tell you that there is more institutional money coming into crypto in the shape of retirement funds. So the amount of money, the amount of interest here that's going into this area of finance is huge and enormous. So these are wonderful, but there are many challenges ahead of us. I would like to get down to the technical challenges, but I can't go, you know, go past the slide except uh, by mentioning regulatory clarity. This is something that's absolutely essential. Better regulation seems like it's it's needed by the lawmakers, uh, and I hope that, that that regulation comes in some sensible form, because some insensible regulation can actually set us all back by, uh, by, uh, by quite a bit, cause the innovation to happen elsewhere, uh, or maybe to happen uh, without, without being compliant. So this, this area cannot be stopped. The innovation will happen one way or another, and it's much better to have bright line rules that people can comply with than to have uh, craziness, so to speak. Okay, so uh, moving forward. The opportunity is huge. It's absolutely big. We are moving from traditional assets to new programmable assets. Now, pay close attention because my vision here is different from what you used to hear from other people. I am not pushing a single coin to overtake the US, US dollar in dominance. I am not here to push one single asset. Our vision at Avalanche is that there will be an enormous explosion as people try to digitize their assets. And that digitization needs to happen on a flexible foundation, on a fast foundation, on a scalable foundation. 
And those properties are absolutely essential because if you look at these new assets and look at their demands, they are far in excess of what old technologies could deliver to us. Now, these assets are very different from traditional ones. The old ones are, are you know, they represent ownership. They're on paper, typically. They used to be. Uh, they're stored in siloed databases when they're not on, on paper. Uh, there's, and there's manual post-facto compliance. Somebody goes and audits Wall Street all the time. And what happens? Every six months, there's a scandal. Every six years, there's a big scandal. And you know, every decade or so, there's a collapse of some kind. So that's what you deal with. With the new programmable assets, you've got programmatic ownership. It's stored on interoperable network. It's open. Anybody can audit. And compliance is built in. I hate it when Wall Street says, oh, you crypto people don't have this, that, and the other. No, we have things that are far better than anybody on Wall Street. And they're coming. And they're coming at a scale and, uh, that, that, uh, that can handle the demands of these new applications. Now, what does this give rise to? Well, it gives rise to a whole range of interesting things that one can do. So what you used to do in terms of ownership, in terms of stock splits, lockup periods, the right of first refusal, et cetera, regulations, these can be built into the system and into the fabric. Payments of different kinds can be built into blockchains. Compliance is it can be built from the ground up in a way that doesn't require post-facto checking. So programmatically, you can rule out unwanted behaviors. This, of course, in turn gives rise to streamlining of business processes. So these different things that actually work well together, fund management, uh, payments, lending, supply chain, trade finance, all of these things can, uh, can couple together uh, to be represented on a blockchain. Now, what's the problem, though, to, to go from this, this big unifying vision of digital assets traded globally uh, from where we are today? And I will name three big issues that uh, platforms today face. The first one is simply one of scale and performance. Current chains, current systems prior to Avalanche were unable to reach the kind of, uh, kind of scale, kind of performance that they need to reach these global audiences. They're not usable. They provide the lowest common denominator service. Look carefully, and I know every techie that's watching this knows what I'm about to say. Everybody copied their entire vision, modulo a single tweak here and there, from Satoshi Nakamoto. Pretty much it's just the same idea, one network, one virtual machine, one coin, let's push the coin and let's build one little thing with one little tweak to allow us to market that thing. And uh, there is not enough avenues for customizable implementations. There's not enough avenues or, or possibilities for building in regional compliance. It just doesn't compute, and therefore you find yourselves, in fact, one finds oneself in a, in a domain where you have to now push for global, uh, you know, some, some crazy, uh, crazy world where global uh, differences don't exist. Well, they do exist, and the winning chains and the winning systems will have to take them into account. And last but not least is governance. These chains must serve people. They must have nobody in charge, and yet they need to be able to adapt. That's very hard to do. It's impossible to do, or it used to be impossible to do until recently, uh, without making people subject to algorithms. And algorithms don't serve people. You need to be able to adapt your algorithm. No one can do, can, no one, we know nobody could do a five year economic plan. Nobody can do a 50 year economic plan. Any algorithm that's fixed is going to have issues in the long term. And the current landscape then consists of a bunch of mature coins like Bitcoin and, um, and some second generation protocols that added uh, features on top of it, like Ethereum that brought programmable assets to, onto it. So the first generation was just decentralized money. They, uh, they compete with the dollar and the euros of the world. The second generation coins are programmable assets. And, uh, but then they still have that same one size fits all mentality built into it, one network for the entire world. And that network is, I don't know what it is, but I, I think it's safe to say that it's congested on any given day, especially today. Um, and then finally, third generation protocols are here. And these are here to provide the foundation for a fully digital economy, an economy that is fast, scalable, and flexible enough to fit the whole world with all of its differences. So um, let me give you a quick primer on my area of expertise, distributed systems. This is an area that has had 45 years 
of, uh, of, uh, of research done in it. Um, I think everybody is familiar with Satoshi Nakamoto's enormous invention, Nakamoto style of protocols known as proof of work protocols. These protocols are wonderful. They showed us exactly what one can do, which is hold a lot of value in a decentralized substrate. But they are necessarily of slow and limited capacity. Bitcoin's uh, method of scaling is to scale at a layer above the lowest layer. And uh, these have long confirmation times. So for Bitcoin, as you know, it's about one hour for a transaction to be considered final. So, uh, uh, so that's one issue. The second issue is they're necessarily centralized in the hands of, uh, of people with access to hash power and mining rigs. And, uh, and then those people, of course, uh, also conglomerate additionally in, in, in the shape of mining pools. And finally, they're wasteful. The energy that uh, is spent on proof of work is not going into transaction processing. It's going into a, into a dead end fight among the miners that doesn't improve the performance of the chain uh, underneath. So um, well, is there anything else that's better? Well, you are being served by a whole bunch of teams, a whole bunch of recycled academic work from the 80s and 90s. That work established uh, what we now call the classical consensus protocol family. These have, uh, uh, have a bunch of uh, uh, features. They're typically based on voting. So you establish a small set of people who hold your ledger and they vote to, uh, to admit additional transactions into that ledger. Satoshi knew about classical consensus. This, was, this has been in existence for a long time. The fastest, best algorithm for classical consensus is an algorithm called uh, Hot Stuff, uh, designed where the first author is my PhD student, Dr. Ted Yin. And uh, it's used in uh, Facebook's uh, Libra, now named Diem. So these classical consensus protocols were known by Satoshi and he refused to use them because he decided that they were too centralized, that he could not build an open platform on top. And they're fragile. These things uh, tend to, uh, to keel over because uh, they have some really stringent requirements about keeping membership information in sync across the network. There is a new play in town. There is a new entire approach to consensus. It's known as Avalanche, the protocol um, uh, itself, the protocol family. And uh, the instantiation of it is also called Avalanche, so don't get confused. Um, but it's an entirely new family. It's leaderless at the network level. And it has the best characteristics of Nakamoto and classical consensus. It's robust like Nakamoto, but it's very, very quick like classical consensus. Decisions, decisions in Avalanche take less than a second to become final, permanent, and never to change. And there can be parameterized to be resilient to attacks over 51%, providing immense amounts of security. And they're capable, most of all, they're capable of scaling to millions of full block producing validators. So that's not something that anybody else can say. And of course, they're efficient and green. You don't have to melt the poles to get a mediocre amount of decentralization into your system. What you can do is build something or use a protocol that is far better, far more advanced. So these protocols, if I were to look at them, uh, as I mentioned, the classical protocol family is very low latency, high throughput, very lightweight, green, but it's not robust. It's not decentralized. And Nakamoto is great at those. And Avalanche is great at, at, at the, is, is essentially the best of both, and it scales like no other. So um, the, uh, what I want to say in, in the next few minutes is just talk a little bit about decentralized finance. It's an entirely new uh, set of applications that are being built on top. And they, uh, they necessarily require um, a, uh, uh, they necessarily require uh, a uh, highly scalable uh, underlying substrate. And, um, and so uh, there's a lot of catalysts for why we are moving to DeFi. Uh, but all I'm going to say is the, 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 the area is so attractive that the yields far exceed what anyone can find in traditional finance. So um, total va value locked is going up, as one can see. Um, but there are some, some challenges ahead. I think one of the big issues is smart contract security. Another issue is self-policing policing to squash scams. I think getting rug pulled is, has been a terrible thing for the industry. And uh, the third and most important one is the user experience in DeFi. The user experience is abysmal. This thing is very, very, very hard to access for most of the world. The fees alone on the common platform, which is Ethereum for DeFi, is, is just enough to put most people away from DeFi itself. So uh, what we need are platforms that uh, deliver a much smoother, 
further experience at the of the cost. And they can only do that if they can scale. And uh, again, very, very quickly, I want to mention a few things about NFTs, which is, uh, I think you could see what well, this particular picture behind Andy Boyan as he introduced me. Um, it's, uh, these are really interesting um, uh, new assets that have probably uh, had the uh, fastest path to going mainstream than any other financial asset to date. What we see with NFTs are um, just the surface. We're getting the most superficial of uses for NFTs. NFTs can stand in for credentials. They can stand for digital identity. They can stand for creator rights and royalties. And uh, so this opens up an entirely new world for, for the chain that can actually accommodate these multitude of uses. And uh, we at Avalanche believe that we have just that chain because I think my one thing I should have mentioned earlier that I didn't mention is that Avalanche supports multiple virtual machines. It's one of the, in fact, I think it's the only chain I know that supports multiple virtual machines in the same fabric. It's the only chain that supports that I know. Oh, it's not only, it's, it's one, of, one of three chains I know that supports uh, multiple different subnetworks. So, uh, uh, so I, I think on that note, what I'm going to do is stop there and say the world is incredibly bright for uh, the blockchain, for the future of blockchains. The demand is immense. We are seeing, again, uh, lots of traditional players come into the space to at least to check it out and potentially to, uh, to, to actually uh, invest a, a substantial portion uh, of their accounts under management. These institutions coming to this area will find that the new uh, systems are uh, capable of um, of actually putting away the myths that many people have have uh, not the myths but but some mantras that have become commonplace that have now turned into myths. Blockchains are not necessarily small. They're not necessarily of limited scale. They're not necessarily expensive because they're limited in scale. We have new protocols, new systems that are fast that can accommodate multiple modes, uh, modalities of usage. They can uh, accommodate multiple virtual machines and multiple subnetworks with different underlying rules. Every subnetwork could correspond to a different enterprise use or a different country's laws or jurisdictions, et cetera, to be able to accommodate they, those compliant use cases that require those, those characteristics, or they could require some kind of an agreement, a voluntary agreement among the participants, uh, or what have you. The, subnet, the, the sky is the limit when it comes to subnet definition. But what you can have today are big systems that, that allow multiple separate uh, specialized blockchains to exist. Combined, um, I think uh, the world is, ex is incredibly exciting for the future of blockchains, and uh, we, we stand poised to open up an entire new era of Byzantine fault-tolerant systems deployed at scale. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I always appreciate your insights on the state of the industry now and consensus overall. So thank you for coming. We very much appreciate it, Goon, and it's good to chat with you again. 